Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm here with Dr. Derek Elliott. He is a newly minted doctor of philosophy from Duke University. He specializes in philosophy of psychology as well as action theory with a special interest in irrationality and evolutionary psychology. And today we're going to talk about his recent PhD dissertation, which is called Beyond Enlightenment, the Evolution of Agency and Modularity of the Mind in a Post-Darwinian World. So, Derek, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. It's really a pleasure to everyone. The pleasure is all mine, Ricardo. Oh, okay. Okay, so let's see. Let's start with the title of your dissertation, because I, I guess I also decided to invite you here, first of all, due to the title, because when I first had the idea, I hadn't yet read it completely, so... but. I mean, beyond enlightenment, the evolution, the evolution of agency and modularity of the mind in a post-Darwinian world. So uh, it, it seems that uh, what you're trying to convey with your title is that perhaps some things that we've been discovering, p particularly over the last 150 years or so through Darwinism and natural selection and things like that, is that perhaps some values and beliefs coming from the philosophers of the Enlightenment are not really that uh, correct, let's say, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, the title actually is a play on words in a lot of ways. Uh, on the one hand, you know, I'm, I'm talking about evolution in terms of evolutionary theory. On the other hand, too, it's sort of a call to evolve our own thinking about these topics, and particularly the topic, in particular, the topic of um, I, the title had thrown some people off when they thought about post-Darwinian. They were thinking more along the lines of some sort of a post-modern idea about things. But for me, it's really about this is the world now, the intellectual world that we've inherited after Darwin, right? And so it doesn't mean anything more than that. This is the world after Darwin. He's completely changed the way that we look at things. He's given us a different conceptual toolkit with which we can analyze phenomena around us. And it's time that we start taking advantage of that. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So I've already talked in the show on the show with people like Michael Ruse and other people like that, and I've already went through some of the uh, values of the Enlightenment and even some that come from before the Enlightenment that Darwinism really questioned. Darwinism, when applied to philosophy, of course. But uh, what would you say are some of the main values or beliefs of the Enlightenment that you really question in your thesis? Yeah, so it's kind of difficult to narrow down precisely what Enlightenment is. It's a debate amongst scholars that even when I was doing my research, uh, there was no clear consensus. Do we consider it a historical era? If so, when does that historical period begin? Uh, is it a set of ideas? Did those ideas themselves have a lifespan of their own? Are they still alive and well? By every indication, it seems like these ideas are still rampant. It's a hot topic right now. As we know, uh, Steven Pinker published a very successful uh, book entitled Enlightenment Now. And it's sort of this romanticization of the enlightenment that we adhere to enlightenment values, that we continue in the spirit of the enlightenment. So if we're going to look at enlightenment that way, we have to start asking, well, what is the enlightenment? Now, for me, every story needs a villain. And the enlightenment, in many ways, is my villain. And I try to zero in on what I call the enlightenment attitude. Like every good story, the villain often thinks that they're working for noble purposes, right? So I'm not, I'm not somebody that you know, I, I don't dislike the Enlightenment. I, I don't regret that it happened. I admire it immensely. I love the thought that came out of it. I think that it was one of the brightest spots in at least the Western intellectual tradition since ancient Greece. Uh, but 
we've sort of held on to some of these ideas that are no longer tenable. Now, in particular, what the Enlightenment attitude, uh, the values that the Enlightenment attitude holds that I've identified uh, through the work of people like Michael Gillespie, uh, even Steven Pinker is pretty open about this, is the idea of the freedom of the individual, the goodness of science, uh, the goodness of social progress, but above all, the value of reason. And it seems as though what the Enlightenment really espouses is this idea of human nature that, in the, uh, that stresses that we are somehow essentially rational creatures. And this is, this is an idea that, you know, when you look around at uh, the way in which we behave and how we interact with one another, you look at, for example, the war on terror, you look at things like mass shootings, uh, you sit there and you start asking yourself these questions. Like, how is this stuff happening? How is this stuff happening? How is this stuff happening? And we don't really have a good response. And we just sit there and we, we, we contend, oh, people are rational creatures. People are rational creatures. You know, if we just have a, a strong enough argument, everybody's just going to concede to that argument. They'll change their minds. Uh, the problem isn't that we're uh, irrational in some capacity. It's that, you know, we just haven't been exposed to a good argument yet. Uh, this just seems absurd to me, right? And we need to start questioning once more uh, what reason is. And I don't think that the paradox, the, the irony, if you will, in this is that many of the Enlightenment thinkers, at least Kant, for example, would say, yeah, absolutely. We need to start uh, criticizing reason, figuring out what is its limits, how does it work? And we're in a better position today to do that than we've ever been with the advances that we have in neuroscience, comparative psychology, uh, evolutionary psychology, social psychology, ethology, uh, even to some degree anthropology. And, you know, uh, so my project then is to try to, to put all of this uh, into view, if you will, to say, all right, this is where we are. This is the view of reason we've held up to this point. And this view of reason, it, it's time for the for us to move beyond this view of reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, it's very interesting that you refer to reason and perhaps there are also other cognitive features of the human mind that the Enlightenment figures refer to and, and perhaps they think about them and talk about them in ways that convey the message that perhaps uh, things like reason work in ways that are perhaps idealized by them. And I mean, perhaps that's one of the big issues that you point to, uh, to in your in your thesis, in your work. And uh, I mean, we could perhaps talk about others and we're going to talk about them here today, certainly. But perhaps would you say that that's perhaps the main issue here. It's not that you're questioning or someone is questioning the existence or not of reason, but perhaps it, uh, as an evolved feature of our minds, it works differently than the way the philosophers of the Enlightenment and perhaps scientists as well put it for a long time now. Right. Yeah, so my relationship with reason is complicated. Um, on the one hand, you know, it, it seems so obvious that we have this capacity to reason, right? Uh, but on the other hand, there might be more to this than we've thought. We may be taking this for granted. So, you know, with vision, for example, it was long sort of held that uh, however the world is, is the way that we perceive it. But we know this to be wrong now. And we know in terms of the neuroscience that we've got neurons that, that code for vertical lines, horizontal lines, diagonal lines, uh, neurons that code for motion in a horizontal direction and a vertical direction that try to detect spatial differences. And all of these things together uh, in aggregate eventually work their way up to the prefrontal cortex and furnish for us this visual experience. And we also know through physics that the world is nothing like the way that we experience it. Uh, to that end, I can't help but wonder if the thing that we've been calling reason all along and supposing to be a unified uh, faculty or ability or capacity, if you will, is not itself its own kind of aggregate. And when you look at the literature in comparative psychology, for example, 
uh, you do find instances all over the place where, you know, animals uh, are able to do one thing, but they're not able to do another. So, for example, uh, Nathan Emery and, and Christopher Bird uh, popularized what's become known as the Aesop's Fable paradigm. Uh, now, in Aesop's Fable of the Pitcher and the Crow, uh, it was this story about how this crow was thirsty and it came upon a pitcher and there was a little bit of water in it. But the problem was the uh, neck of the pitcher was too narrow and too deep for the crow to get the water. So what did the crow do? Well, Aesop relays to us that, clever as it was, it found some pebbles, displaced the volume of water in the pitcher, and was able to drink. Now, for the longest time, we took this to be a moral, right? That if you just keep it something long enough, you'll succeed. Uh, but Bird and Emery, uh, they decided to see whether or not there's any kind of truth to this experiment. So they took a set of rooks, which are, you know, corvids, birds like crows, and they wanted to see whether or not they could solve the Aesop's fable paradigm, is what they called it. And they set up an experiment just like uh, the way that Aesop relayed to us in his story. And what he found was that these birds were capable of problem solving, right? They, they had a novel situation introduced to them. And they were able to take objects and figure out that if you place these objects into these cylinders, you could displace the water and get the access to treat. Now, this experiment has been replicated with uh, young children. It's been replicated with Caledonian crows. But unfortunately for scrub jays, they're not able to figure out how to solve the Aesop's fable paradigm. So naturally, our tendency here at this point is to think, well, maybe scrub jays are not as an, as intelligent as crows and, and rooks, you know, the corvids. Um, and that's, that's a tempting position to take because we have a tendency to organize things into hierarchies. Human beings are at the top of the hierarchy, right? Um, but scrub jays do something really fascinating, right? So um, it was Nikki Clayton, uh, another researcher, who discovered that what scrub jays can do is they are aware of the presence of other scrub jays and they can plan for future events. So when they're given food, for example, uh, they'll eat what they need to now. And if they're worried that they're not going to have food later, they'll then hide or, or cache that food for a later date and time, especially if they know they're going to be in that area. Um, now, another interesting twist on this is that the if there's another scrub jay present, and the it notices its rival, right? Uh, then it will wait for its rival to leave, return to the place where it cached that food, and hide it in a new place. That's pretty intelligent. That's pretty remarkable, actually. Especially when you consider that, as far as we've been able to tell at this point, monkeys don't do this. So it seems to me that there are a number of what you might call quasi-rational uh, or rational-like capacities that are operating in all of these different creatures, including humans. And I think that in our case, what we might be calling reason could be just a number of these capacities operating in concert through the medium of language, and it, it has the illusion that it's a unified capacity when it might not be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and I mean, at a certain point uh, earlier in the conversation, you referred also to freedom, and I guess you also alluded to free will as another belief, let's say, of the Enlightenment, because it's really important, or it was really important for people in the Enlightenment to think that people were re really had the freedom to behave as they willed, let's say. Uh, so, um, I mean, I, I guess that we can tackle this issue uh, from several different points, and perhaps the first one would be that, uh, I mean, most of what goes around in our minds operates at a subconscious level, and we don't really have access to it. And even uh, what motivates us and what causes our behavior. Uh, I mean, we're pretty bad at identifying those sorts of things, correct? Oh, absolutely. And this is something that uh, I think the ingredients for this uh, idea has been there for a long time, but it's only recently started increasingly picking up within intellectual circles. 
Uh, I found all the way back to, I think it was 1932, with an experiment by Norman Meyer, who was a Gestalt psychologist. And what he decided to do was set up a, a rope uh, in the middle of a room. And there was another rope at the far edge of the room. And the goal was to try to see if people can figure out how to tie these ropes together. And uh, what he found was that people would spend time in this room and, you know, they're seeing their problem solving and, and they just, uh, there's one solution that he had in mind, the difficult solution, if you will, that he wanted people to find. And he would leave them to their devices until they figured out how to do this. Um, interestingly enough, when enough time would pass, he would have uh, the experimenter walk in, into the room uh, brushed by the central rope, and it would set it into a swinging motion. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, uh, one of the, um, uh, what are you, uh, the name's slipping my mind, um, participants, right? Uh, all of a sudden, one of the participants would uh, uh, say, hey, look, we can set this rope into a pendulum-like fashion and attach it to the other rope. Uh, when queried after the experiment was over, uh, most of uh, a number of the participants actually said that you know the the idea just came to them, right? And it there was a, a relationship between the time the experimenter would would brush the central rope and the time that the participants solved the problem that the participants themselves were not aware of. They claimed that the idea came to them on their own. Some of them would even say that they didn't even reason the idea. They just visualize the idea, right? They thought about monkeys swinging on trees, and they're like, oh, look, I can solve a problem this way. Um, but others, you know, they thought, oh, I, I, of course I thought of this. Now, the interesting thing, of course, is that when an experimenter didn't brush past the rope, uh, some participants didn't solve the experiments at all, and others, you know, if they solved it, it was usually very quickly. But it was only after the experimenter brushed past the rope did many solve it within 60 seconds. Now, when you have something as statistically significant as that, it's clear that that played a role in figuring out the uh, how to solve that problem. And yet so many of the participants were unaware of it. That was 1932, right? Fast forward about 40-ish years, and you get Richard uh, Nesbitt, right? And he has his set of stockings that he presents to a number of individuals. And he says, hey, by the way, which of these is your favorite, right? People sit there, and they pick up each nylon. They're looking at it. And they're like, I think I like this one the most. Uh, you ask why. They sit there, and they give a number of reasons. Uh, but unbeknownst to, to, to these participants, right, uh, the nylons are identical to one another. And there was a tendency to select the fur, uh, the far most right nylon. Uh, so again, there's there's almost like this right side bias that these participants have that they're unaware of. Uh, even more recently, and perhaps more significantly, has been the work by Peter Johansson and Lars Hall on choice blindness, right? So in this case, uh, and this is far more clever than anything that's been done, uh, they present participants with, say, photos of uh, people that they might find attractive. And they're like, here, here's a couple of photos. Uh, select the one that you like the most, right? People make their selection. And then when they're not looking, he swaps out the one that they liked with one that they did not like. And he said, why did you choose this photo? They're looking at it. And they're like, well, obviously. And they start, uh, you know, uh, enumerating the number of reasons why they chose the photo. But it's not even the photo that they selected. Right. So uh, it, it's fascinating to see these experiments and you have to just admire psychologists for the cleverness that they have in designing these things. Uh, but we learn rather quickly that we are out of touch with our decision making processes. We're out of touch with our motivations. We make selections and then we try to construct justifications for those selections after the fact. And that seems to be how the decision making process works by and large. Mm -hmm. Yes, th th that's very, very important for this discussion, all of what you just said, because I think that uh, I've squeezed in the topic of free will and freedom here when we were talking still about reason, because I mean, I think it's very difficult to talk about this topic separately, because 
I, I mean, uh, I, I've, I've, have, I've been having a lot of discussions with mainly evolutionary psychologists, but particularly after the ones I had with people like Hugo Mercier and uh, Nick Chather and Alexander Rosenberg. I mean, it's very difficult to look at what goes around in our minds and particularly how reason or rationality works after that, because I, I mean, uh, it, it seems that people from the Enlightenment and people that still promote the values of the Enlightenment and as we've already said here, that's not really the problem, it's, the, it's just the way people deal with uh, their beliefs about how the human mind works, let's say, because uh, I mean, it is one thing to say that, uh, as you just said, through the experiments coming from social psychology and other disciplines like that, that we're not really aware of most of the things, of the processes that go around in our minds most of the time. And when we're asked to explain why we performed a certain behavior or, or why we did such or such thing, we're really bad at identifying the causes behind it. So, I mean, when people believe that we have a certain particular feature of our minds called reason that we use, that, that uh, evolved for, uh, to motivate us to seek the truth. So that, that, that's already a very problematic point to make. But if they go further and say that uh, whatever we gain as knowledge through that uh, cognitive process also, uh, also trumps what happens subconsciously even in terms of our decision-making process, let's say, let's put it that way. So, I, I mean, what I'm saying here, does it make sense or, or not? Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, the, the so just to circle back around to the question of free will, right? Uh, I, I, it's, I don't know right now how I feel about free will. All right. Uh, I have ideas and I'm leaning towards a kind of emergentism. But what I do know about free will is that I don't think it has anything to do with conscious thought or reasoning, right? If there is free will, then it's more intuitive, more spontaneous. It takes us in many ways back to the ancient conception of free will that you find in somebody like Aristotle, who tells us that it's a matter of uh, motion coming from within, right? Uh, rather than external, uh, rather than having the motion caused from external forces. And when he says this, he means obviously that if someone were to barge into your room, pick up your arms and start moving your arms around and forcing you to move your mouth, you're not doing that, right? But as it stands, uh, you're sitting there, you're talking to me, you're moving your hands. All of that activity seems to proceed from you as an organism, how you're structured, your system, uh, your your neural system, your um, muscular system, all of these things play together to produce these things. It's not clear that they're caused by any sort of outside agents um, that are, you know, that that are coercing you in many ways. So it's it's a mitigated view of freedom, and some people may not say that it's freedom at all because they might argue that. You know, when you, you analyze it down to the atomic level and you figure out how, level, how all of these things interact with one another, you're not really doing anything. Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. Uh, but, you know, for now, I think that this is the best view of freedom that we have uh, and that if you like free will, uh, that, that's, that's the only thing left, right? Um, now, when it comes to uh, the topic of, of reason and, you know, how we're supposed to be thinking about this, uh, I it seems that uh, the enlightenment attitude, what I call the enlightenment attitude, was influenced significantly by Descartes. And what Descartes, uh, you know, uh, bequeathed to us is three, three assumptions about the way the mind works that we've had a really difficult time forfeiting. 
Uh, one, he tells us that the mind is fundamentally rational. Well, we know that that's obviously not the case. I mean, if you just even spend a little bit of time in comparative psychology or ethology, you have no explanation for how animals are able to do the things that they do unless you want to say that animals are rational. But then you're going to start running into difficult questions like, well, what's the rela relationship between reason and language? Uh, you know, how, how, uh, you know, how can we assess whether or not animals are rational? And then when we look at something like the Aesop's fable paradigm, we have to have a good explanation. Well, you know, why is the scrub jay failing at Aesop's fable paradigm, but then is clever enough to hide food from its peers? You know, so it just raises more questions uh, to attribute rationality to uh, animals in the way that we think of it in, in the Cartesian sense, right? Uh, that, that's not to say that we can't think of animals as behaving rationally in other senses. The second thing he tries to tell us is that the mind is a unity, right? Uh, that, you know, somehow the mind is not only rational, but it's it's unified, it's, it's uh, non-composite, it's nothing like the body, right? That you can't divide the mind into parts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And both of these assumptions together deliver to us a third assumption, which is that the mind is uh, is transparent, right? You can access all the parts of your mind. And clearly, this is not the case, right? We, we have to let go of these ideas if we're going to make any progress and make sense of these things. Now, to Descartes' credit, uh, and this is something that I find kind of, you know, in some ways humorous, is that when Descartes began his inquiry, he entertained broadly three possibilities, right? That uh, the mind is the way it is as a result of there being some kind of omnipotent, benevolent God, uh, chance, right, or nature, uh, which he, you know, made synonymous with chance, uh, or, uh, uh, you know, a malevolent, evil, all-powerful demon, right? And he concluded that if the mind is the way that it seems to be from his perspective, it must be the case that there's this benevolent God uh, that, you know, gave us this kind of mind. So now we can... We can track truth. Uh, we can figure out all the mysteries of the universe. We can solve all problems. We can master nature. We can have uh, all sorts of material prosperity, live forever, and never get into war again. Uh, obviously, much of that is problematic and false. Uh, but when you take God out of the so so Descartes, I you know I admire his consistency. You you adopt that position about the mind. You can explain it with an assumption about a, a benevolent creator. Now, if you secularize that and you try to, to drop the benevolent creator out of the picture, it becomes really difficult defending a Cartesian theory of mind. Like, you're telling me that uh, it's just a totally random chance accident. The human beings are the only creatures in all of the universe that somehow ended up with a mind uh, such as the way that Descartes imagines it. It's rational, it's unified, and it's oriented towards the truth. This just seems so far-fetched uh, that it, it, it amazes me that anybody could uh, at once adhere to something like evolutionary theory and these Cartesian ideas about the mind. Something has to give. And of the two, I think it's clear that the Cartesian theory of the mind is now outdated and should be on its way out. Mm -hmm. Yes, and you just brought Descartes to the table, and I think it's very interesting because... Uh, looking back at his work, at a certain point he says that he decided, even though that's very doubtful, he decided to uh, suspend all of his beliefs uh, and try to work from there. Uh, and, and I mean, at a certain point he simply uh, decided that, uh, that, that there had to be some sort of God uh, and... Uh, f uh, beca because he had this idea of a god, of a perfect being in his head, right? And so he couldn't have this idea if it wasn't true that a god existed. And then if a god existed, what he saw in the world had to be right. Otherwise it wouldn't be a god, it would be a demon or something like that tricking him. Uh, but it's very interesting because he really believed that 
uh, uh, through uh, uh, some sort of a conscious proce process and through reason he could have complete control over what happened or what went around in his mind but he really didn't because we even know nowadays particularly particularly through disciplines like uh, the uh, cognitive science uh, of religion and things like that, that even the idea of a metaphysical being or something like that is something that arises from underlying evolved cognitive features of our mind as well and even perhaps other things that that also uh, he considered when going along with that thought right yeah i i am not um so when it comes to descartes the thing that has always fascinated me is the juncture that he presents to himself uh he wants to know how is it that what he thinks is true can actually be true. Uh, and he supposes that, that, that that's the case, right? That when you know something like two plus two equals four, right? Uh, how is it that, that, you know, that idea of yours uh, happens to match the way that reality is? Um, and so the juncture that he presents to himself is that, well, you know, uh, it seems as though we can make th that, that we can trust inferences, logical inferences, uh, if we've been designed in the right way, right? And so ultimately, in some ways, he's kind of like a progenitor to intelligent design theory. Um, so, you know, his his solution is that if we were, if the mind were the product of chance, our inferences are, could not possibly be reliable. They would have to be subject to the same kind of chance uh, that, you know, we find in nature that, you know, maybe sometimes these inferences are good, sometimes they're bad. How can we trust our inferences? And that was kind of a crisis for him. He was very uncomfortable with that possibility. Uh, and, you know, uh, as it stands, it looks like maybe that that uh, path is the path that he should have explored a little more thoroughly because things seem to be more like that uh, than this idea that, you know, uh, a good inference is reliably good at all times. Uh, that as long as you've got the, as long as you start out the right propositions and you make the right inference, you'll have the right conclusion. Um, but you know, people that adopt that position, you know, they don't ask, uh, they don't ask, well, where do those propositions come from? Why are we using this inferences as opposed to that inference? You know, and how do we know that these inferences are even, or how do we know that these propositions are are even? Uh, sound in the first place, right? So, uh, you know, th these are questions that are now beginning to be explored. Uh, the, the literature on cognitive biases is revealing quite a bit to us uh, when it comes to these types of things. Uh, for example, uh, it was uh, Daniel Kahneman that identified the substitution heuristic, where when we're presented with a difficult question, uh, what is it we like to do? Well, we like to you know, sort of envision a, a simpler question and then try to answer that one in its place. And again, you know, uh, it, it's easy to think, well, people are somehow doing this on purpose, that they're, they're devious, that they're deceptive, that they're insecure and they don't know the answer to that question. But, you know, really a lot of these processes are just automatic, right? So you you are, are posed the difficult question. You don't identify it necessarily as a difficult question. But were we to measure things like pupillary dilation, heart rate, cortisol levels, you might see a little bump in stress. And in response to that, let's just shift the question altogether and make it something that we can work with. Um, so, you know, it's th these are this just these are fascinating times, and you know, it's 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 kind of interesting to see how some of these things were anticipated, but they just weren't explored. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So I would like to ask you what the, what is your opinion about uh, Mercier's and Sperber's enigma of reason and the argumentative theory of reason. But just before we get specifically into that, um, I guess that another perspective that we can have about reason and rationality uh, has to do with the way we think about it and perhaps what we classify 
as uh, rational behavior because I mean perhaps since we're talking in Darwinian terms here perhaps it would make much more sense to uh, classify as rational behavior perhaps the sorts of behavior that we would adopt and that would increase our fitness both personal and inclusive that is behavior that would be adaptive to us and, and not really something that if we were to pursue intellectually or mentally would lead us to the truth or to just uh, think in strictly logical terms or something like that yeah so uh, this is a, an interesting topic because i think a lot of people when they think about evolutionary theory they tend to think of survival of the fittest right the, the water down to something along those lines and it's it's uh, the same kind of problem that has been posed to me by people familiar with my work they're like well you know uh, if, if, you know, you're defending, if you're trying to analyze these things in terms of evolutionary theory, what's the ultimate good for man, right? Uh, is it just to, to reproduce and have babies and, you know, dominate your, your peers and your competitors? Well, you know, no, that's not the types of creatures that we are. Um, what makes, what I think makes us fascinating is that there's three, if you might call them, evolutionary domains in which we live and breathe, right? There's the natural domain in which we're primarily concerned about survival, right? So you go on a hike through the woods, uh, all of a sudden uh, your, your bottom-up attention is directed towards what seems to be a tessellated pattern on the ground. Uh, all of a sudden your muscles tense, your neck turns, your eyes look, and it's a snake, right? This is the, this is a good thing, right? It keeps you alive, it keeps you healthy, it keeps you, uh, you know, it helps you you continue to to live and breathe. Um, the second domain would be what we might call the sexual domain, right? So we're motivated by sexual preferences. We're sexual creatures. Uh, it should no longer be taboo to pronounce these things, right? That this this is a very important part of what it means to be a human being. Uh, we find things attractive. We find people attractive uh, that motivates our behavior, that uh, you know helps determine how we interact with other people, uh, so on and so forth. The third part of this that often gets left out of the equation is that we're also social creatures. And to be a social creature is to be concerned with how others take you to be. Uh, when you consider our roots in foraging groups uh, that were highly egalitarian, uh, we seem to have evolved this very strong sense of who we are relative to how the group perceives us. And we take this to be something very important. Now, this is something that would have made sense 50,000 years ago, where you're in a small group of 20 to 50 to 75 people, in which you're expected to contribute to that group and there's some kind of a misunderstanding, right? A competitor accuses you of cheating, uh, you know, you, you took more food than was necessary or you didn't pull your weight uh, when you were out hunting some megafauna. And uh, without language, there's not a whole lot of options here, right? If uh, somehow they're able to, you know, persuade the group of their sentiments, you're going to be kicked out of the group, uh, if not killed, right? And the problem there, if you're kicked out of the group, and we know this from studies of primitive societies today, is that it's as good as death, right? The, the world, the environment is a hostile place. As much as we fantasize about the frontiersmen living out in the woods, cutting down trees and sustaining himself, that's just not realistic in a world without technology. You have no idea if a storm's coming. You have no idea if there are predators lurking around the corner. Uh, you have to constantly prepare your weapons. If you twist your ankle, uh, it's already going to be difficult to continue navigating through the forest, especially if you're a couple miles away from home. So we rely heavily on group membership and leaning on other people and caring for other people. And with the advent of language, all of a sudden, you're able to negotiate with your accusers, with the rest of the group, 
you know, sure, you know, they might think that I took stuff, but clearly I didn't. And here are the reasons why, uh, you know, I, I should be a part of the, I should continue part of this. In fact, that person's lying and we should, uh, we should, you know, um, uh, kick them out of the community, ostracize them, right? Um, so this social dimension in which we have a vested interest in our reputation is another part of that uh, evolutionary question of, of, you know, trying to maximize our fitness. It's our survival, our sexual fitness, and our social fitness. You know, we, we want to get along with others. We want others to like us. Uh, we, we want to feel like we're a part of something. We want to feel like we're making contributions. We want to feel like we're admired. Uh, and again, uh, like any kind of evolutionary explanation, these are the ultimate explanations, not the proximal ones. The proximal ones are the ones that, you know, are the ones that are crossing our mind. We convince ourselves, oh, I, don't, I don't care what anybody else thinks, but our behavior betrays us. It, it tells us otherwise that, that we do care. And we do try to, uh, to, to rally people to our side of things. Um, so, you know, uh, when it comes to uh, Mercy and Sperber's interactionist theory of reason, I think it very eloquently ties a lot of these things together. And I think that it's a, a view of reason worth considering as a replacement to the Cartesian view of reasoning. And, uh, you know, it sort of shakes us out of this disillusionment of solitary reasoning where we can arrive at the truth by locking ourselves in our room and starting with assumptions and critiquing those assumptions and seeing what follows from those assumptions. All of that's absurd, right? This is in some ways a return to a platonic Socratic conception of reasoning where if we want to arrive at something worthwhile. Um, I'm reluctant to, to call it truth because I don't want it to be, you know, I don't want to misunderstand this as, as you know, we, we have final answers to things through interacting with one another, but a truth for the community or a, a truth that we can put into practice. I, I'm a, a bit of a pragmatist when it comes to truth. Uh, then we have to subject our ideas to the scrutiny of others, interact with them, exchange them, and see what emerges from that interaction. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about questions relating to agency and things like that. So, I, I mean, it's pretty obvious, particularly from uh, studies done in biology and psychology as well, perhaps more particularly in comparative psychology, that, I mean, uh, humans and also other animals uh, they, they don't really need to be conscious of the reasons that motivate them or whatever happens in their minds that motivate them to seek this or that or to perform this or that kind of behavior. Uh, and I mean, they don't even need to be conscious at all to behave. I, I mean, if necessary, we could even go back to plants and they have certain kinds of behavior and they don't seem to be conscious at all and they don't uh, seem to need consciousness at all to have those sorts of behaviors and even some lower animals we also question if they really have some sort of consciousness or not. So, uh, I mean, with that on the table, uh, what place does it leave for consciousness from an evolutionary perspective. I, I mean, I, I don't know if you want to specifically talk about consciousness here or not, but he, he, I've already had a couple of conversations with people like uh, Colin McGinn and Michael Graziano, and I will also have a Keith Frankish on the show to talk a little bit more about illusionism. Uh, and I mean, it, it's with this on the table, it's... Uh, a bit difficult to understand why really did consciousness add to evolve uh, and uh, part particularly to the level where we have it in humans. Yeah, I, I don't know how I feel about consciousness at this stage. I, for a long time, uh, wanted to think that consciousness was something special, uh, not even something special to human beings, something special in general. Uh, I wanted to think that, you know, uh, 
it's obvious that we're conscious, you know, uh, but the more that I, I think about consciousness, you know, we sort of think of it as um, it's almost like a, a, an introspective capacity to look at the inner contents of our minds, to perceive the inner contents of our minds as we perceive the outer world. Um, but I, I, you know, for me, I, I try, I'm trying to take a step back and I guess work up to an idea of consciousness. And I don't want to just presume right out of the gate that consciousness is the way that we've assumed it to be uh, here up to this point. So I have to ask myself, well, what is consciousness, right? Is it simply awareness, awareness of one's surroundings, or is it some higher kind of awareness where it's awareness of inner contents as well? Uh, is it, you know, having a sense of self? or having a sense of self relative to uh, things in the environment. You know, these are questions that I think we need to parse out before we endeavor upon answering this question. Um, so as of now, uh, the view that I adopt is, is a little more moderate, and I am very attracted to uh, Crick and Coach's view of consciousness as almost a dashboard, right, where some of the most important stuff relative to our situation here and now is brought to our attention as an organism. Um, now, you know, some of that stuff is, is you know, ideas that cross the mind that might be important. Some of that stuff is stuff that's happening out in the environment. Um, I don't know that that's unique to human beings. And uh, I have to wonder whether or not there's a sense of consciousness of the external environment alone, right? Uh, so what I find intriguing, one of my hobbies is is macro photography. And in particular, I really, really, really love photographing insects. And I'm fascinated by their behavior and all of the details that you see when you look at them under magnified uh, resolution. To do this well, uh, I have to buy a macro lens, attach it to a camera, and then go out into the field and observe and watch and, and you know, wait, try to, to get the perfect shot. And this requires a lot of patience. And you see a side of the world that you don't normally see. You see uh, these insects engage in what looks to be complex behavior for what they are. It's clear that you know, they're not simply little machines, uh, you know, that they don't have the same reaction to all things. Uh, it's, it's not as simple as a one-to-one -one reaction. Now, this might be anecdotal, and so you question the reliability of it, but uh, when you look at, uh, there have been studies, for example, on bumblebees, where they seem to engage in in learning behavior they learn where the predator like on what color flowers predators are to be most likely found and they adjust their behavior accordingly they adjust their flight patterns they take a longer time at these flowers uh, where they found predators uh, uh, to inspect them before landing to collect pollen and sometimes they even get it wrong sometimes they they seem to make the judgment that there's a predator uh, and they'll fly away from the flower when, in fact, there's there's no predator at all. So when you see this capacity for misrepresentation, uh, when you see this capacity for error, and when you see this capacity for learning, uh, I have to think that there's more going on than than we we've tended to think. Um, so and and that's just at the the small scale, right? You're talking about a bumblebee with a meager 100,000 neurons. Um, so you know this is um, this. Uh, so what this uh, what this sort of inclined me to start thinking about is, uh, you know, if these are not simply machines, uh, then what does that say about us? What, what can we learn about ourselves? And where do we stand in relation to these things? Unfortunately, evolutionary theory sort of neatly ties all of this together. Uh, one of the articles that I had read a while ago that I, I really... I had increasingly become fond of uh, was an article by John Searle called Animal Minds. And in that, uh, he pitches what we might call a thesis of biological continuity. So what he wanted to know in that article was, do, uh, do animals have thought processes, intentionality, and consciousness? 
And, you know, he talks about his relationship with his dog and how he can make these different inferences. He critiques Cartesian theory and uh, arrives at the idea that uh, he proposes the idea that if behavior is sufficiently similar to what an intelligent creature would do in that situation, and if it's biologically similar to an intelligent creature, then perhaps similar things are taking place in that creature's mental life as it is in the intelligent creature's mental life, our own mental life, right? And uh, I think this is a wonderful idea, and, and I think it's, it's uh, a great place to start when we're studying these things. And we want to be careful, too, because some of these creatures might have different thought processes, radically different thought processes, and deal with problems in a radically different way than our own. And so we don't want to prematurely dismiss them if they handle things differently. So, for example, going back to the Aesop's fable paradigm, uh, the rooks and the Caledonian crows very predictably are able to learn how to displace uh, water by dropping heavy objects into the cylinder and getting their treat. Raccoons do this some of the time, but they also seem to be much more playful and mischievous. And in fact, some of them uh, sort of rejected the experiment altogether, knocked over the cylinder and, and got their treat that way, right? Uh, and they, they seem to do it as if they, they understood, like, why am I playing around with these heavy objects? I'm just going to, you know, get my treat directly, right? So uh, you might say that they have a, a different problem-solving ability from uh, Caledonian crows and young children. Uh, and, and, you know, perhaps even scrub jays have a different, you know, maybe it's not that scrub jays uh, lack the problem-solving capacity as uh, corvids, but maybe they just have a different way of solving problems. So, so it's, it's a great place to start, this idea of biological or evolutionary continuity. But we also want to be careful that we don't suppose that there's uh, – a similarity of degree uh, such that, you know, get into that hierarchical mode of thinking again. Humans are at the top. And yes, these things have agency and these things have mental life and these things have experience, but it's in just a diminished sense from what we human beings have. It might just be something different altogether. Um, you know, I, I think it was the uh, species of shrimp that I, I can't remember exactly which kind, I want to say mantis shrimp, but I could be mistaken. Uh, that sees many, many more colors than we do because it has more rods and cones. Obviously, its its visual experience is going to be very different from our own. Uh, and when it comes to insects uh, who have compound eyes, uh, the way that compound eyes resolve vision is very different from the way that our own eyes resolve vision. And so their visual experience, if and we're assuming that they have visual experience, is going to be very different from our own.